Hey, thanks for joining us today on Uptime Logistics, powered by Cap Logistics, and I'm your host, Doug Draper, with the Denver Transportation Club. Today, we have a, an, an awesome guest, and we're excited to get into the topic. We're going to uh, be talking about um, oversized loads, uh, and Craig Hurst with uh, CDOT, Colorado Department of Transportation, is with us, and we're really going to learn about lessons beyond the pilot car, if you will. There's a lot more to uh, permitting and understanding what's going on on our roads in Colorado than simply here's an extra, f uh, an extra fee uh, to help uh, with oversized loads. So Craig, we're really excited to have you with us today. So thanks for joining. No, I appreciate you guys having me on. This is a topic that I'm uh, very passionate about and I'm very excited to get into the details. Nice, nice. Well, Craig is the manager for CDOT Freight Office and he's actually a councilman at large for, uh, for Commerce City as well. So we're excited to have you. Craig, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of how you got involved. And I know you have some, uh, some transportation origins in your, in your story. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure do, yeah. I, um, you know, finishing up college was, was a forklift driver at Conway Freight back when um, they existed and um, moved up through their management development uh, program. Had a couple very, um, fun roles, good development roles, uh, moving up, you know, moved to Southern California. I started in Sacramento, moved to Southern California, out to Reno, Nevada, did some work around the region and then came out to Denver. But, um, you know, from there, got into CDOT about four years ago and, um, and been on Commerce City City Council for about 18 months. And so uh, there is definitely some overlap in my job at CDOT, um, obviously being the freight office manager, I, I talk about trucks. That's what I do, uh, truck regulation. Uh, but also, Commerce City has 72 trucking companies, you know, give or take at any given time. So, um, lots of overlap, and I, I, I um, love to talk about all the fine details of truck and truck permitting and truck regulation. Yeah. Well, I was saying before, and I was talking to my wife about this show, and she was actually engaged in it. So I know it's going to be good, good content. She actually, especially some of the stories we'll, we'll get into. But uh, before we get into the analytics, which I think is the really unique aspect of this, uh, of this podcast, let's set a baseline a little bit and kind of understand what is overweight, oversize, and I've actually heard the term super loads in, in the sure. past. So uh, without extreme detail, just kind of go into what each one of those means, and, and um, that'd be a great start. Yeah, I could bore you guys all day with, you know, 21 different permit types and how they break down and all the differences. But the, the gist of it is we have single trip and we have annual permits. Uh, annual permits um, can also be bought at a fleet level. And so there's um, kind of economies of scale there. But single trip permits, um, really anything under 200,000 pounds can be uh, classified as an overweight permit. So the federal government or FHWA dictates that 80,000 pounds is the legal weight limit on the interstate. Anything above that, um, only non-divisible loads can get a oversized permit for the inter or overweight permit for the interstate. Um, so there's a lot of different breakdowns, but when you hear the term super load in Colorado, that means a load that is over 500,000 pounds. Um, we get more than 25 of, the, of those loads a year. Um, so they're not as frequent as you would think, maybe two or three a month. Um, and they are seasonal, obviously more, more during uh, good weather times. But those strictly are 500,000 pounds or, have, or heavier. We also have a category called Chapter 6 permits. Um, those are over 200,000 pounds, but under 500,000 pounds. Um, it's found in Chapter 6 of the rules, and that's <laughs> <laughs> why it's called a Chapter 6 permit. Um, but then again, we, we uh, oversize is really anything that's over eight foot six wide, um, over 14 foot six tall. Um, and then we don't have a length limit in Colorado, but we do have a trailer length limit of 57 feet, four inches. Um, so then that's when we start getting into some of the um, oversize. Your longer vehicle combination, so your, your triples or your Rocky Mountain doubles, um, those types are also would be considered oversized, but we call them longer vehicle combination permits. Got it. What are um, some of the industries, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, maybe the top three or four industries out there that generally pull permits, you know, I've seen um, yeah. uh, different types of equipment running down the road. So give us a snapshot of that, please. 
So one cool thing about um, our current permitting system, which is done through a website, is that we can keep a commodity report. And we don't ask for you know granular, granular detail of what you're moving, but we want to know what kind of equipment it is. Or So we really are looking at top five commodity reports. So from 2019, it was construction equipment, oil field equipment, construction ma materials, wind energy, and farm equipment were our top five single trip permit commodities. So, um, you know, the, the construction industry, uh, especially uh, in Colorado has been going strong. Even through 2020, we have seen a very slight, very slight um, reduction in permits, but 2019 was the a year that we issued more permits than ever before in CDOT's history. Um, and so we are less than a thousand um, from 2019 numbers in 2020. So uh, you know, we'll talk about this later, but this is kind of a leading indicator in the economy showing that the construction industry is still operating pretty strong through the, the uh, pandemic. And so um, these commodity reports are really important there. Uh, but, but you also see, you know, one interesting um, data set that we have is, you know, shows that there were 725 recreational oversized moves uh, last year. That's a lot of boats. <laughs> that's really what that is that's a lot of boats um and you know because boats uh larger boats immediately when put on a trailer become an oversized load and so um lots of, of boat transport uh seasonal boat transports occur in colorado mm -hmm. we also had um looking at aircraft 628 aircraft permits so lots of helicopters lots of uh, aircraft movement and um, one interesting thing too is we actually issue permits for military loads and a lot of them um, over you know over 1500 military permits last year and that was a very interesting thing that i learned when i came to cdot is that we issue permits to the military you know i was under the impression it's kind of you know the government's road they can they can travel right. on it but absolutely not the case um obviously we still have to protect our infrastructure so there is mm -hmm. a, a permitting process for them as well yeah well, you made mention um, about leading indicators, kind of business trends out there, right? And I think you, uh, one example you gave is that uh, the perception of the economy uh, where we are right now would have business down, but you just said that um, as far as uh, construction equipment really hasn't seen that significant of a downturn. What other type of industry indicators do you see out there? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you see a blip during harvest season. Sure. Is there other type of, um, of indicators out there that you guys can pull from the data? Yeah, so so harvest season, we have specific permits that, that really cater to the harvest season. We have something called a non-interstate overweight divisible permit. Uh, as the title says, you can't, can't operate on the interstate, but it allows you to get additional weight on our secondary roadways. Uh, we have a six-month um, permit for that. Uh, there's, there was legislation that kind of got put on hold last year for a three-month version of that permit. So you'll see some harvest um, seasonal harvest fluctuations, you'll see that, but you'll also see um, like where federal subsidies happen in wind energy, you'll see spikes when a subsidy is in, and then you'll see um, some down, you know, when the subsidy goes away, then you'll see less wind energy moves. Um, I think that's pretty natural just based off the politics. Obviously oil and gas moves um, have significantly changed as the oil and gas um, economy in Colorado has changed. And so uh, you'll see those fluctuations. The one, I guess, leading indicator that I'm looking at right now is that the construction materials and construction equipment market is still, uh, from the permitting side, is still very strong this year in 2020. Um, and so that tells me that the, the kind of construction industry is still doing projects. And so um, we see that at, at CDOT, you know, our projects are still, still moving strong. Um, but just in general, to see the numbers that, that are equivalent to 2019 numbers with very limited fall off. And we actually started the year stronger than, than we did in 2019. Um, and so, so those things, um, and even in farming, we're still seeing very, you know, very similar uh, trending numbers. Um, and so, so I think those things really can tell you a picture of uh, the things that are kind of happening behind the scenes, not everybody pays attention to. Uh, they are, the, the permit data kind of can give you a different picture on bigger industries that are moving. And so um, the construction materials is, is a very key teller for me. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. It's like a crystal ball to some degree. What, what we were talking uh, earlier about kind of the layer, the layering and some of the visibility you get with the permits. And we spoke about short term uh, licenses and permits where um, you could come in and just get a six month driver's license to help do some of these heavy hauls. I don't know if you could explain a little bit about that. Well, yeah, I think, I think there's a, a sector of the, of the harvest um, industry that, that does come in and has, uh, you, you know, somebody come in from another country and gets a short term license through the DMV. And that allows them to um, do, to be employed for some of these, um, you know, three month harvest seasons that you, that there's a lot of, of product brought to the market. And so there's, there's that layering there, there's, you know, one of the things that we're trying to do at the state is kind of make compliance you know, easier. So there's several different agencies that regulate in, the, in, in trucking. And so uh, one of the things that happened this year, and this was, this was uh, not a state ran bill, but it did move uh, hazardous material permitting from the public utilities commission to CDOT, which will then uh, move those permits into our already oversized overweight permitting uh, process we should streamline some of these processes. And so there's, there's layers in uh, ownership of a, of a trucking company that, you know, you must comply with just for compliance sake for, from FHWA and state regulations, you, you must kind of check all those boxes. And we're really trying to make it easier to check those boxes by uh, using technology to promote compliance, meaning, you know, centralizing where you maybe only have to have one login instead of four logins when you're going online. Um, because you're, you're getting it all from one agency. So um, the, the, the layers in permitting um, really start to show themselves, though, when you talk about uh, municipalities, meaning counties or cities can also have their own. Uh, they own their roads. They maintain their own roads. So mm -hmm. the state doesn't have a right to issue permits on their roadway. Um, and really where we start to see challenges is, is kind of that continuity of routing or continuity of the trip. You'll have some, some municipalities uh, may not, may only want you to travel at night while others um, will have the opposite. And so you, you'll get, even inside the state of Colorado, you'll get some of these hangups. Um, you'll, you'll have companies that'll go um, out of their way to avoid certain areas because, um, you know, on a certain route, they, they, they can't be held up for, you know, six hours and wait for the sun to go down or vice versa. And so, um, you know, there is, the, there are those complexities built into permits from the industry side that we are constantly trying to work with our partners uh, at local agencies um, to improve those, you know, there is uh, work being done to, you um, take over Denver city and county permits at CDOT, but um, we wouldn't collect any of the revenue. It'd, it'd simply be for efficiency's sake and Denver city and county would still collect their permit revenue. It just would be done all on one single system. Um, that way for ease of use by the end user, um, you, you kind of log in once, put in one application, get multiple uh, permits out of that. And so that that's pretty exciting. Uh, that takes quite a bit of work because you have to import all of Denver city and counties, uh, road data, vertical clearance, all the others. And so mm -hmm. we've been working on that for a bit and hope to have that delivered soon as well. Nice. Very good. So some of the analytics that we had, we had talked about is road usage, right? So obviously mm -hmm. there's certain routes that are probably more, um, favorable, uh, to oversized permits. And, and you had made mentioned, uh, two things that kind of caught my attention was, the, uh, the port of entry into the state, which was the highest, the, the, the largest number of permits coming into there. But the second one really caught my attention. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about those two points of entry, right? The, one of them seems pretty obvious, the other one doesn't. And then what does that tell you, right? What does it tell the, the, the um, CDOT on road usage and, and what do you do with that data? Yeah, so, so this has all been you know, pretty recent and very fun. Um, look, way of looking at permits. So on single trip permits, we actually issue a route. And by doing so, we now have route data. Doesn't really matter to us who the company is or um, any of that, but we care about the overall dimensions and the commodity, trying to understand 
you know, how that corridor is being utilized. So what we started to do is I, I now have a GIS specialist on my team and she's, she takes this data and maps it for us. And so we started to be able to visualize uh, what is going on in Colorado. And one of the first um, projects that we took on was a weight restricted structure that is five miles north of the New Mexico border uh, on I-25. And it's only in the northbound lanes. And really that, that structure has been weight restricted at about uh, just over legal weight um, since 1996. And people have known, you know, some people in our community, the, the permanent community have known about it, but, but in all other communities, they look like a fine structure because uh, its rating showed it had a 30 year lifespan, everything was great until you got into overweight loads. Um, and really what I wanted to point out is the impacts that having that structure there being weight limited, I wanted, I wanted others to understand the impacts of not fixing that structure. So what we did is we started studying uh, the uh, traffic that's moving in and out of the borders of our state. And so we wanted to see, you know, at what point is the highest usage of inbound outbound route in and out of our state for permits. That's uh, just north of Fort Collins, south of Cheyenne at the Wyoming border. That's our number one in and out for permits. Where it becomes interesting is what's number two. You would think since I-25 is number one at the northbound, the southbound would be number two. You know, it's a, it's a good north-south route. Um, it would make a lot of sense for trucking, uh, where east to west doesn't necessarily make sense for trucking because of the mountains. Um, but number two is actually the 287-385, um, Highway 287-385 at the Oklahoma border is our second highest entry point into our state. Um, and why is that a problem? Well, oversized load, so that is the Ports to Plains corridor and we want trucks on that road. Um, that, that is a great connector from the Houston port um, and you know Texas and the, the supply chain that flows through their port. Um, so the Ports to Plains corridor should be utilized. But when you get into the oversized um, end of transportation, that road's a two lane road and there's not, there's not wide shoulders, there's not good places to pull off. And it creates issues for not only the, the, the drivers that are hauling these loads, it puts you know, everybody that lives in that area at a greater risk. They're having to pull into the drainage ditch while a wide load goes by. Um, you know, they, the pilot cars are having to shut down the roadway because you know, a, a truck's having to make a turn on a pretty tight angle. Um, all of those things have impacts some some small impacts, um, but some can be pretty pretty significant. And so that's one of the challenges that we're creating is 287 is not designed for heavy haul corridors. Um, but it becomes a natural it becomes a natural route because as you're coming through Texas um, and you're trying to to get maybe an oil and gas product, a slug catcher, which we've had slug catchers that are 425 feet long. 20 feet wide, um, you know, they have 30 plus axles, they're 1.4 million pounds. There's not a whole lot of routes that you can get that um, to travel through our state. And so um, they, it becomes a natural route out on the 385 corridor on the Eastern side of our state because there's no vertical clearance issues out there. Uh, traffic density is not very high and um, it's a pretty straight, straight road, straight line. And so, but not built into that are some of the protections of, you know, um, wide shoulders, um, areas to pull over and, and, and store a load overnight that, of that mm -hmm. type of size. And so we have to work through some of those challenges and some of those challenges create some pretty funky routes throughout our state. Uh, what permit data has allowed us to do though, is create heat maps and we can show where we use, um, where chapter six, loads travel the most what routes we have to use the most for those where super loads travel the most or where loads that are over 17 feet tall travel the most um and and when i say travel the most i have five permit techs that issue 65,000 permits a year um you know there are some permits that are automated meaning um they don't ever have to have a human interaction because they fit into a certain size and weight envelope um, where we don't have to make an interaction. But 
those individuals are routing every single large load and they have to go through kind of that painstaking process to make sure that um, all the data that we have in our routing component is appropriate and the turn radiuses and everything are approved. Um, and so those routes get used over and over again because we've already, um, you know, well, we would use this route, but this bridge is too short. We would use this route, but you know, this bridge is weight restricted. And so you start to find routes that don't have these restrictions and they become your primary trucking routes. And so now we've been able to highlight better than ever um, what those primary trucking routes are by taking permit data, creating heat maps of every, every route that we've issued over the last three years. And it really paints a picture of what are very important to this industry, the heavy haul industry um, in the state of Colorado. And I think that this starts to lend itself to economic development, how you bring ma manufacturing into the state, um, kind of how you support uh, the e-commerce and you know that boom of mm -hmm. transportation market um, all of those things can matter because if you're using data like this you can improve your maintenance scheduling by understanding what's on your roads um, you can uh, use this type of data uh, to fix that that structure that i was talking about on i-25 after I, I made the point of the secondary impacts of not fixing that weight restricted structure we then use that data to apply for National Highway Freight Program funding, which is a, a federal and state um, funding program that focuses on freight safety and mobility. And we got the $840,000 needed to make the, the essential repairs to that structure so it won't be weight restricted any longer. Mm -hmm. um, by doing so, we've estimated that it saves about 143 miles per trip and opens up over 200 new routing options because you've opened the southern border for us. Um, mm. And so what that does is it, it doesn't put all the density of this heavy haul traffic in one geographic corner of our state. It allows for a truck to enter in a second location that's more viable if it's a wide load. Um, but from there, they can split off in you know 200 plus new directions. And so um, you're opening up a whole section of the state with great routing opportunities. And that we, we got to that point by understanding data, visualizing that data, and then have, you know, it, it didn't need to be very analytical at that point because the picture told you everything you needed yeah. to know. So yeah, it, it was sure. uh, been pretty cool. Yeah. I think, you know, looking at, uh, at numbers on a spreadsheet is not as impactful as looking at the, the heat density and things of that nature when, when we looked at that map. Uh, together, I was really surprised. Like there's this glowing red dot in the lower right-hand corner of our state in the southeast part sure. that you never would have thought. So, so you here's know, the question. It, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say it's not it's not it's not really a joke, but it, it it's expected and it is a bit funny. I, you know, we regularly have farmers' wives call and say, "Hey, you're trying to kill my husband because you're bringing these wide loads through, and he's having to pull our tractor into the drainage ditch, and it's you know tilted on its side and um, and I get it. I, I really do. Um, trying to keep those trucks safely moving through our state uh, is a full-time job for my staff, just making sure. And it's, it's, it's not that we don't want, we want those trucks on our road. Those, those are, it's great for economic development, for our economy. Um, but it's how do we do it as safe as possible with the least amount of exposure to risk. And so mm -hmm. that's what we're consistently trying to do. Yeah. So the route, the northbound uh, I-25, down Trinidad. Has that been fixed? Ten, we... October 15th is the project completion date. And so we uh, are very excited to, uh, as long, you know, as long as we don't get another freak snowstorm, I think we'll be okay. But on, on the project completion date, but we are very excited to kind of celebrate that, start studying uh, the return on investment immediately. Um, because that idea can be utilized in other locations around the state. Um, it doesn't fit every bridge problem. It's not the solution for all of them. Uh, we we uh, just funded a bridge just outside of Grand Junction that was also weight restricted. And it was, a, it was an even simpler fix. Um, it was like $55,000, but it fixed the weight restriction problem. And so uh, we are taking on some of these issues that have been been there 
you know, for a couple of years now and trying to find um, good, good ways to, to fund these issues so we can kind of eliminate them from the routing challenges in Colorado. Yeah. Interesting. Well, October 15th bides well for harvest season, right? So those uh, farmer wives probably won't be calling you quite as much after the 15th. So. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think give it a good two years, we'll really have some good data to come back and talk about and just see how, um, how that's kind of played out in this world. You know, there's some interesting other perspectives to consider. Uh, Oklahoma's permits are considerably higher than, than ours in New Mexico's. Um, and so if you have the option coming out of Texas to either go to New Mexico or Oklahoma, uh, the, the financial side of any business is going to pick New Mexico. Um, you know, there's, there's other reasons not to, I'm sure at times, whether it's construction restrictions or, or their own set of routing challenges. But, um, you know, there are other perspectives that lead me to believe that I-25 will, will, get, will take away even more of, the, of that traffic. Yeah. That's terrific. So any other type of things that we could gain or glean, if you will, from the, from the permitting data, you talked about the, the analysis there. What about like, you know, road construction? We talked about the bridges, right? To alleviate yep. or be able to handle the oversized loads. But what about, Hey, this route on 285 um, gets used uh, twice as much as another route. And therefore we need to tear it up or maybe we just need to repave it. Um, is that analytics helping you try to figure out, what do we do because there's ruts in the road? Do we rip it up and redo it or do we just, just pave it? I'm assuming that this data pro provides that uh, visibility as well. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I'm not a pavement engineer, but I know that this type of data is now playing a role in maintenance scheduling. And so when you lay, you know, and obviously the uh, materials engineers at CDOT can use this in consideration on how they're specking the materials that we're putting down on the roadway. Um, if you understand that the road needs to be able to accommodate a 97,000 pound non-interstate overweight divisible two, three axle permit, as well as a 110,000 pound non-interstate overweight divisible quad permit, those things can be considered. Uh, when our secondary road weight uh, is usually 85,000 pounds, which you can see the 5,000 pound difference from the federal interstate weight. Um, we, we should be designing to some of these challenges. And so understanding what roads have the high usage, Highway 85 is a you know, major north-south heavy haul corridor. Um, you know, those types of things have to be considered when we're planning projects. Um, the, that's probably the most critical. You know, we've taken data um, to projects that the solution that was best found through the engineering process was a roundabout. Um, I know that's a bad word in trucking. Uh, it, it really is. Um, it, they even make me cringe a little bit, but, it, but I have a ton of confidence in CDOT in their um, willingness to reach out and learn the data that, you know, the Highway 52 at, and I-76 at, in Hudson, Colorado has um, a project that is currently underway and it's going to build a roundabout on each side of a truck stop. Seems very counterintuitive um, mm -hmm. to the layman like myself that's not an engineer. But what I can tell you is they took three years worth of permitting data and they, they, they studied the size of these uh, dimensions of these loads. They ran them through AutoCAD programs that showed their ability for a wind energy load so a really long you know 67 meter windmill blade um, that's you know 220 feet long they can make it through um through these roundabouts because of 17 foot lane, uh, lane widths um extended uh, aprons on the side nothing tall in the center so you can actually crab around uh you know obviously you'd have to shut down the road but when we get loads that are extremely long people people get um, a little weirded out by this, but what happens is the front of the, the load will go right around the roundabout and the back of the load has steerable axles and it will go left around the, and it's called crabbing and you'll crab around a roundabout. And so if you put, you know, welcome to the town of Hudson sign in the middle, well, we're gonna need to lay that down every time we have to crab a load over that roundabout. And so that considerably changes the way we design things. Um, 
there's a permit option that that uh, you can select that says you're operating a low boy so you have 18 inches or less of clearance um, and we will consider that when we're designing we consider how many low boys use that route and you know obviously the the angle of the road matters so you don't want to high center loads uh, when you're in design so I think just understanding the dynamics of what's out there will really actually help this industry move forward and have infrastructure that supports continuing to move these larger loads. Um, you know, ski, ski resorts depend on heavy haul because how do you, you know, how do you build chairlifts without all of the material? Mm -hmm. um, helicopters aren't that efficient once you get that high in elevation. So that all comes by truck. There's a lot of things that, you know, we couldn't enjoy in Colorado if we didn't have, you know, oversized overweight uh, loads transporting, you know, almost all of your electrical generation equipment comes in on an oversized load, oversized yeah. and overweight. Um, so a lot of things that we, we kind of take for granted in our day-to-day -day life were either only possible because of oversized overweight transport or that significantly drove down the cost because you were able to build it at the factory and then transport it as one piece to the job site. You know, if you didn't have oversized overweight trucks, you'd probably have to transport that in several pieces and then, you know, put it back together at the job site. And, and, and with bigger projects, we see that, but that is very expensive to yeah. do. Yeah. So, well, it's interesting to hear all the analytics that go around it where the average individual may be driving down the street and say, hey, that bridge doesn't look like it's broken. Why are they spending this money in my tax dollars to fix it? You know, sure. um, when you've given some great examples of, of how the, the, the weight and the ability to bear the, um, the load, you know, impacts a lot of other things out there. And, and of course, I learned the best, uh, best term of the day, which is cra crab a load. So I'm gonna try to figure <laughs> out how to use that in my, <laughs> in my vocabulary this weekend. But, uh, so, so, you know, from a more day-to-day -day use, understanding bridge quality and weight and, and weight restrictions can affect your firefighter's ability to route. Now, if your house is on fire, I'm not sure they care about the weight restriction that's in front of them on, that, on this structure. Maybe, maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't. I'm not sure. Um, but I care, you know, knowing that I care that, you know, we need to make sure we're, we have um, good structures that support, you know, our emergency services that are full of water, you know, <laughs> in certain situations. Uh, maybe on the way home when they're not in an emergency, they should, they should definitely follow those laws. But we just got to make sure that we understand all of that stuff because the, the reason you'll hear me talk about loads that are 425 feet long and 30 plus axles is not because the product itself is super long in most cases. It's mostly because the product is incredibly heavy. Um, so a slug catcher for the oil and gas, um, natural gas processing is, let's we're talking about like 1.4 million pounds. Well, it's really not that long of a piece, but you have to spread out that weight so far that people just don't realize uh, what I what I tend to tell people at CDOT, since our headquarters is in the parking lot of the Broncos Stadium, is that yeah, that load wouldn't fit inside that stadium. It would be too long uh, because it's far longer than a football field. And so then people go, okay, now I get how how big we're talking about. And so um, or you know you can line up 32 cars next to that uh, standard size cars next to that load. And so just understand that sometimes um, those loads need the space you know they're very critical to our economy and, and they need the space so um, pilot cars are critical pilot cars doing their job appropriately is very critical um, if you see csp escorting a load it's we require that escort over 20 foot wide um, but they can also any any carrier can go out there and say csp i have a 17 foot wide load but i have um I want, I want to pay you guys to escort us. They can, they can do that as well. Um, but, but, you know, to me, it's critical that everybody knows that, you know, there are challenges built into our transportation system. We don't want to put them out in the middle of the, you know, interstate. And we actually have time restrictions that don't allow for these oversized loads to be there during um, high traffic times. So from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and from 3 to 6 p.m., you'll never, you should never see an oversized load on the interstate because that's not legal. Yeah, 
Interesting. Well, you know what? I can't thank you enough for, for coming and joining us today. I think we've learned a lot about, you know, the perception isn't necessarily the reality. The perception is some of these things that uh, are required uh, and some of the infrastructure built around it that needs to be adjusted, you know, has a purpose and, and, and meaning behind it. So I want to thank you for joining us uh, on the Uptime uh, Logistics uh, uh, show today. And I'd also like to thank all of our audience members uh, for joining us on Uptime Logistics. Of course, it's powered by Cap Logistics. You can find more information about the show in the description below. And don't forget to like and subscribe uh, to the channel. And please visit caplogistics.com for all of your transportation needs. Craig, thank you very much. It was enjoyable. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.